trust and obey Jesus lead the way huh? praise the Lord <clears throat> Today we're going to be um, starting into somewhat of a lesson plan on the armor of God. And we're studying the armor of God on Wednesday evenings and we've been, well we're just really getting into it even though it's been a few weeks. Uh, it's very interesting, it's a very interesting study and uh, we all know that the battle that we're in in this life is not a battle against flesh and blood but it is against it is spiritual warfare and uh, that sport spiritual warfare cannot be defeated with guns and knives and swords and whatever or you cannot protect yourself with a suit of armor physical armor but in scriptures Paul tells us to put on the armor of God the spiritual armor that will protect us. Um, we're going. To, I'm going to just get into a little bit of that this morning to touch on that. Next week we will get into that spiritual armor that Paul tells us to put on. Uh, but today I want to be in uh, to uh, a part of uh, of how that armor plays out, and we're going to look at what Saul. Saul told David when he went up against Goliath, put my armor on, David. It'll protect you. It'll help you. Well, David, he didn't wear that armor. It didn't fit him. <laughs> Saul was a, a huge man. And David was a boy at this time. And David took that armor off and he let God lead the way instead of listening to what Saul had said about the armor. So in that, we, we have all received some kind of advice from someone usually have, have have you guys all received advice i have you know and he, sometimes it was advice i didn't even ask for but i got it anyway you know and the one thing i've learned throughout the years is not everybody that's giving you the advice knows what they're talking about so you have to be a little bit leery of who you're expecting or who you're receiving advice from and uh, as we as we will see here how Saul tried to advise give uh, David advice about wearing his armor but I found this uh, little thing wise advice from kids now these are these are kids that are giving advice never trust a dog to watch your food Patrick age 10. When your dad is mad and asks you, do I look stupid? Don't answer him. Michelle, age 14. Never take, never tell your mom her diet's not working. Age 14. Stay away from prunes. Randy, age nine, he must have ate a bunch of prunes one day. I don't know. I don't know too many kids that like prunes, but uh, anyway, stay away from them. Don't eat too many. Here's one. Here's a good one. Never pee on an electric fence. <laughs> Robert, age thirteen. Don't pull Dad's finger when he tells you to. Emily, age ten. Oh, here's a good one. You ladies will understand this. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> oh, that was Tonya, age 11. Puppies still have bad breath even after eating a Tic Tac. Andrew, age 9. And this one, uh, it's like it could be, it could be bad, but uh, never hold a dust buster and a cat at the same time. Kyle, age nine. We had a cat that had six claws, and they were sharp. And if you turned the vacuum cleaner on, you better be ready. You know, you didn't want to be holding her if you turned the vacuum on. So, and those six claws knew how to dig in. Believe me. <clears throat> if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. 
<laughs> this was a 15 year old so she'd been around the block a little bit she knew what she was asking for and felt markers are not good to use as lipstick <laughs> all right and the last one is when you get a bad grade in school show it to your mom when she's on the phone <laughs> so there is some advice that kids have and uh we do take advice from some people, but we got to be careful with that advice. But that, that was all good advice these kids gave, though. That was, that was some good stuff, so it was. Uh, we're going to start here in uh, Samuel chapter 17, verses 1, <clears throat> 1 through 3 is where we're going to... Uh, we're going to get started in that and then we're going to stop and, and look at those papers as all of you have seen I think I saw some of you looking at the the chicken scratching on the papers that's in your, in your bulletins there uh, but let's get started on chapter uh, Sam, 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 1 through 3 the Philistines now mustered their army for battle and camped between Soka in Judah and Ezekiah at Ephes Damien. Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. <clears throat> now as we see this episode begin to unfold, we, we see that there's two armies, the Israelite army and the Philistine army. And they have both come to do battle with one another. And from what the commentaries I have read is, they stood on each side of a valley with a huge ravine in the middle of this valley. So one, the Philistine army was on one side, the Israelite valley, or the Israelite army was on the other side of the valley. And each army, each one of these armies was waiting for the other one to try to advance, waiting for the other one to attack first. So it's been a standoff, and as we see later on here, we it's they've been doing this for 40 days. They've been, and, and Goliath gets into the picture, and he's teasing and he's taunting the Philistines, and this has gone on for 40 days. But as we as we look at this, we wonder, okay, what's the big deal? Why don't they just go to battle? Why don't they just attack each other? But we can learn something from the names of these places if we uh, if we if we uh, look and try to study those. So if you will, I I gave you these sheets uh, in the bulletin, and if you can read my writing on these, I will take a look at what some of these names what these names mean. So. The first thing we want to look at is the name Soko. And that is where the, uh, the uh, Philistines have camped. Uh, they mustered their army, army for battle and camped between Soko and Judah. Okay, Soko is a thicket or a lair woven from branches. So this place that the Philistines have taken up their encampment is a place that's somewhat fortified, I would say, because there's a, there's a huge thicket or there's a lair that is on one side of them. They're between it. And they're between uh, Ephes, Ephesus Dim, Damien, and that, is, that means the border of blood, where there has been many battles fought in that. So this is where they're at. They're in the middle, and then they're in, on the other side of is Ezekiah. And that's fenced around or strong walls. So here they are. They're in this place. They're encamped in this place where it's a, a place of blood. Or a place, I would say, a place of ambush. And on one side there's a thicket. The woven sticks or woven limbs or something like that. Now, let me ask you this. Have any of you ever went hunting grouse or hunting deer? Where you were trying to flush out some grouse and you're trying to work through the thickets and, and the brush and that or you're driving deer on the river hill through mountain laurel it's like you can't get through it 
I used to do that for my dad. I'd say, Dad, you go out here and sit in this clearing, and I'll go through the river hill, the mountain laurel, and I'll drive them out to you. Well, a half hour later, I've got my coat shed. I'm just sweating, and I've crawled on my hands and knees half the way through this because you can't get through it. So here the Philistine army is. They're encamped in a place where it's a thicket, where it's woven limbs, so to speak. And then on the other side of it, it says there's a fence or there's a wall. So here they are. They're, they're overlooking the Israelite army on the other side of this valley. They're entrenched. They're dug in. They're happy where they're at. It's like, why do we want to move? We have the advantage here. So the Philistine pitched their camp between a thicket and a strong wall. Where, they have, where there have been many ambushes. It's called, this is a place of blood. The place of blood. But let's look at where the Israelites are. The Valley of Elah. The Valley of Elah, or the place of Elah, is where they are, and that means an oak tree. Or standing in the open. So the Israelites, on the other hand, on the other side of the ravine or the valley, they're standing out in the open with no protection. So they certainly, you know, they're vulnerable the way they are, but if the Philistines do attack, at least they have a chance. But I would say if the Israelites were to attack first, I, I think I can see this encampment of the Philistines like a funnel. You have nowhere else to surround them, no way to go around them, but straight ahead, kind of like a killing field uh, in modern day uh, speech, I believe, is what that would be termed as. So here we are. This is, the, this is why the standoff. This is why there is a standoff, because uh, the Philistines do not want to move from their place of advantage. They don't want to move from that area. So there is a standoff taking place. Uh, now, another thing that we want to look at here in this time is why do you suppose the Philistines decided to go to war at this time? Why do you suppose they chose to go up against the Israelite army? Well, I do believe they probably knew that Samuel had left uh, Saul. That Samuel said, all right, Saul, you've done so much stupid <laughs> And which he did. He did a lot of things that were not of God that uh, Samuel just, he, he left him and he wasn't with him. So I believe the Philistines knew that Samuel had gone. That meant that God had left Saul and that Saul was not acting himself. And we find that in verse 15, 1 Samuel verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 34. Then Samuel went home to uh, to Ramah and Saul returned to his house in Gilbeth of Saul Samuel never went to meet with Saul again but he murmured constantly for him or he mourned excuse me he mourned constantly for him and the Lord was sorry he had even made Saul king of Israel and other scriptures tell us that Saul was tormented with a spirit. He was tormented with the spirit. And if you remember the scriptures of David, David played the harp and he could sing. And that was the only thing that soothed Saul's mind. And, and so David got to be around Saul all the time. But David was also anointed be, to be the king to replace Saul. So this was a time where Saul, even though he had been a great warrior, for the Israelite people, even though he was someone that they looked up to, he, was, he had failed God. And God had pulled his blessing from Saul. So now the Philistines come at them. And they're stand, they have a standoff on each side of the valley. And Saul knows that God is not with him any longer. So they shake. The whole Israelite army shakes in fear at this giant that is down there that is tempting them. Satan is like, you know, Satan is like this, isn't he? You know, Saul's at his lowest. The nation is at their lowest. They need a leader. And Satan's like that, isn't he? He's like a roaring lion looking for someone that's weak, someone that's in despair, someone that's, that's on the outskirts or, or has lost favor with God, so to speak, in this instance. Satan's just like that. He likes to attack us when we're down, doesn't he? 
He likes to attack us when, when things aren't so good. And usually it's not one time, one thing, it's two or three, isn't it? This baptistry. You know, I don't think Satan wanted us to baptize anybody here. Because we had some work to do to get it running. It took the biggest part of a day or so just to get it up and running. But it's running and it's heated up. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be used today. But you know, it, it comes in twos and threes. We had trouble with the sump pump out here after all the rain and things. And isn't that what happens? Satan's not happy just to throw one ring air at you like he did Job. Uh, he said, okay, I'm going to take all your camels. I'm going to take all your sheep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take all your possessions from you. And, and that wasn't good enough. He said, okay, now I, I got to take your children from you. And then he took Job's health. So things come at us and, and it seems like an avalanche and that's the way Satan works he's not content to hit us with one whammy he hits us with another one and then another one and, and then that puts us in a weakness that puts us in a weakness so to speak but we don't need to give in to it either we need to say I praise the Lord I'm going to fix that baptistry we're going to get that thing running and John crawled down. There's a little hole over there. He crawled down in there, and we had to tra change out the drain or the, the pipe on it. So it, 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 it's working. But Satan wants to do what he can to stop us. But if we're like David, and we say, Nah, that Philistine, he, he don't have nothing over my God. He can't control me. He can't control me. But the thing is, to get into to get into the uh, the scripture here a little bit more, but even when things are going good, that's when we have to be our most careful, right? When we're down and we know saying, "Oh, you know, he's coming at us," it's like, "Lord, help me get through this time." It's tough. Things are coming at me. It's an avalanche coming at me, and we're kind of tensed up when we're ready to go. We're ready. Okay, we know it's coming. When's the next hammer going to fall? Have you heard that one? When's it going to fall again? But when we're going good, when things are going good, and then bam, something happens. That's when it hits us the hardest. And here we are. Uh, the, the two armies are standing off of each other. You know, things are going good. And Saul thinks they're going good. Or, and the, the Israelite army thinks they're going good. But then that temptation comes along. The temptation comes along to rush in and do something a little bit different. But even when things are going good, Satan can still tempt us. He never gives up trying. Satan never gives up trying. Even when things are going good, whatever it is, he wants to, he wants to be after us. And we're going to see that, how that happened here in this uh, next uh, verses with uh, the Israelites and, and, and Goliath. In verse 4 through 7, then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The, the shaft of his spear was as, as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds his armor bearer walked ahead of him now here we have this giant nine feet tall and there's been a lot of controversy from what I've read in, in uh, uh, different commentaries about how tall he really was but you know I'm not going to argue that I'm going to say okay scripture says he's nine feet tall He's nine feet tall, you know, I'm not going to argue. And, he, he, and he had, his armor weighed 125 pounds. Now, can you imagine taking 125 pounds and putting it on your body and trying to walk around with this? And this is how big and strong this, this man was. And his spear was at least two to two and a half inches in diameter. And the head of that spear weighed 15 pounds. So I can't even imagine carrying that around uh, with, any, with anything, you know. So it's no wonder the Israelite army was afraid of him. They could look 
down and from across the valley they could see this guy's huge and they could understand that the, the spear he had was huge and, and how in the world do you go up against someone like this but if we look at his name even his name is something that would strike fear into those that would understand the meaning of this so <clears throat> in looking at this the, on the other on the back side of your paper here <clears throat> the root of Goliath means to uncover or reveal so Goliath's root the root of his name means to uncover or reveal now he is from Gath 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 I guess meaning wine press and the Philistine the root meaning of the Philistine is to wallow in the dust so Goliath is the one that exposes you who will put you under pressure underfoot to make you wallow in the dust so this is what Goliath means this is what the the Israelite army they understood all of this so this wasn't just a man a big man that they were going up against this was a man that had a meaning in his name that he was going to uncover you he's going to reveal all your weaknesses he's going to reveal all your all your weak points and your and, and your struggles and then he's from Gath meaning he's going to press you he's going to press it out of you and then he's going to put you under foot and let you wallow in the dirt so you know as we start to look at that these Israelites they knew they knew these meanings they knew the meanings to these words but if we look in uh, continue in verses 8 through 11 and 16 Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites why are you all coming out to fight he called I am the Philistine champion but you are only the servants of Saul choose one man to come down here and fight me if he kills me then we will be your slaves but if I kill him you will be our slaves I defy the armies of Israel today send me a man who will fight me when Saul and the Israelites heard this they were terrified and deeply shaken so when they hear the taunts of this this giant Goliath they're afraid they're shaken it says they're shaken there's they're standing and trembling at what Goliath is telling and then over on 16 verse 16 for 40 days eat every morning and evening the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israelite army for 40 days he did this for 40 days he taunted the Israelite army twice a day for 40 days twice a day he taunted them tempting them to run down into the valley to run to run down out of their place that they were they were standing in or they were they were keeping you know where they felt safe to run down in the valley and to attack the Philistines well anybody knows that that whenever you uh whenever you run down a valley and you start going up the other side you've got an uphill battle ahead of you it's not an easy battle it's not a place that you can gain any high ground it's going to be hard to gain high ground because they've already got the high ground on you plus they lit they were in a fortified area with a wall on one side and a hedge on the other side so the Israelites if they would have listened to this taunt or if they'd have given in to this temptation to go and fight against Goliath they'd have probably without God's help they would have probably been wiped out they'd have probably been destroyed so they were holding their position but the thing was that this Philistine was insulting he was insulting God the God of the Israelites <clears throat> but isn't that how Satan works he wants to he, he wants to uh, to insult us he wants to to get us to to run out of, of our place of safety and to and to go across the valley and to do the things that we we shouldn't as I was teaching young people I'd say I, I told them I said don't don't let temptation drag you away from where you're at don't let let temptation challenge you to go into areas that you don't want to go into and, and and even though you think you're strong and even though you think you can handle it or oh I won't venture into that too far I won't I won't go too far I, I, I'll be able to get back up out 
I'll be able to work my way out of it. And I've seen so many kids, as I was a youth pastor for many years, I saw so many kids start down that slippery slope. And man, some of them didn't get back out of it. Some of them didn't get back out of it. They thought they could handle it. They thought they could handle that calling and that temptation that, the, that Goliath has given to the Israelites, that, that Satan and the world gives to each and every one of us. We hear it every day. We see it every day all around us. All we need to do is turn on the news and we can see the transgender issues that are coming out, that, that beckoning and that calling for our young people to step into something that's not going to be able to back out of. And different lifestyles that, that, that people think, okay, oh, I'll try it out, I'll check it out. I saw that with the young people. They were curious. Kids are curious about who they are and what they want to do in their lives and, and how they want to live. And they'll, and they'll experiment. They're going to. They're going to experiment with different issues and different, and different things. But the thing is, you start to experiment with this little thing. You think you've got it under control. And the next thing you know, you're, it's, uh, let's try it again. Let's do a different drug. Or let's try, try this kind of drink. This one sounds interesting. Or whatever it may be. And, and the next thing you know, people have stepped too far. They've started down that valley. And then as they try to get back out of the valley, it's an uphill battle. It's an uphill battle. And that happens with anyone. Anyone that, that, that takes on the temptation. Takes on the temptation of what life is throwing at us. It's not just Goliath that's yelling at the Israelite army, but it's the world that is, that is yelling or is, is trying to get its way in our own lives, in the lives of our, our family and our, our friends. It's when we move from our place of safety, from that place of resistance, that we become vulnerable. We become vulnerable. We're having graduation Sunday next Sunday in the baccalaureates next Sunday. And we have kids that are from high school that are heading out into college. You know, and we have some that have graduated as well and are going to be going into the workforce. And, and I, these kids that are going to college, it's like, we got to keep them in prayer. Because the world doesn't want to... It seems like the world doesn't want what's best for them. The world wants to mold our children and, and these graduates into the shape of what the world wants them to look like. And we as Christians, we have to understand that as temptations come at them, we, they have to be grounded and solid in their faith to be able to resist the Goliaths of the world that are tempting, that are teasing and calling them to move into the valley. You can handle it. It's not bad. You'll be able to quit anytime you want. That's a lie that comes directly from Satan. <clears throat> a lie that comes directly from Satan. So for 40 days, twice a day, Goliath taunted and teased, teased the Israelite army to get them to move. <clears throat> Where did he learn that from? Where did he learn that from? Verse 32 through 37. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, where is 32? There it is. Don't worry about this. This is when David, David comes on the scene now. David tells Saul, don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. <laughs> Here's David. If you remember, David was taking some food to his brothers because Jesse's home was only about nine or ten miles away in Bethlehem from where this battle is there where this standoff is taking place so for these 40 days Jesse has been sending David to take food to Saul's army and to his brothers so David has been running out to the war to the battlefield to the standoff and then he goes back home he tends his sheep he talks with his father. Then in a day or two, he sends him back out. So David is no stranger to what's going on. He's been seeing this Philistine giant standing out there taunting and, and tempting the Israelite army. Every time he comes, it's like, there's that Philistine down there again. Why doesn't somebody do something? You know? So David, he finally comes and, and he says, <clears throat> you know, he said, what's, uh, don't worry about this Philistine. I'll take care of them. I'll fight them. None of you guys. You're standing here shaking in your shoes. Let me do it. 
Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Woo! Now this is a young boy. <clears throat> I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. Now he didn't say he's defied your army, Saul. He's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and the, may the Lord be with you. <clears throat> Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such a thing before. I can't go in there, he protested to Saul. I am not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five sm smooth stones from the stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed with only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. If we look at this, David wasn't afraid. He said, no, I'm not afraid, Saul. You guys are shaking in your shoes, but I'm not afraid because I went up against the bear and the lion and God protected me. God watched over me. He took care of it. He gave me the strength to, do, to, to be able to do this. And in this, David has only mentioned, he doesn't mention Goliath by name. If you look at, if you read through this scripture, he mentions that this uncircumcised Philistine, he says that twice. So he does not give Goliath any credit. He doesn't give Goliath any prestige of even having a name. But in this transit, in this conversation with Saul and what's going on, he talks about God at least nine times. He gives reference to God that many times. So when we're in our battles, so many times when we're when we're we're up against it, we want to give Satan too much credit. In this, in this, uh, David is calling him an uncircumcised Philistine. He's already looked at Goliath as he's been defeated. He's already looking at him as, you're nothing, Goliath. You've been defeated. And he mentions God's power and God's protection. And that's the way we need to be looking at our battles. When we're up against that Goliath that is in our life, let's not give him any credit. Let's not give him any credit because he can't harm us because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that protects us. We only need to recognize that Satan has been defeated by who? By Jesus and by his blood. And if we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and give Christ and have recognized Christ for what he has done for us and we call upon his name, that giant cannot do anything against us. Satan can't harm us. He can't come. He, he can tempt us just like he is with the Israelite army. He's tempting them. But he can't go up against the Israelite army on his own. And that's the way we are. We need to not even give, don't give Satan any credit at all. What's the scripture tell us? What did Jesus do? Satan, get thee behind me. And if we proclaim the blood of Jesus Christ, and the blood by the blood of Jesus Christ, Satan, get behind me. You get behind me. I want nothing to do with you because you're defeated. You're defeated. You've already lost because my Savior Jesus Christ shed his blood for me and for all of mankind. That's how we whack our adversary, this adversary Satan, is to not recognize that he has any power over us because he doesn't, only what we give him. In verses 38 and 40, um, 
Well, I did 38 and 40, didn't I? Okay. We need to look at that paper again. 38 and 40, I guess I got ahead of my notes here. <clears throat> but uh, in this, we want to put on there, we want to recognize that ant man's armor does us no good in the spiritual battles we face. Man's armor does us no good. All Saul saw was, a, was man's way to do battle and looked upon an enemy too big to defeat. That's what Saul saw. He saw Goliath with all this armor, with all his strength, with all the things that he had going for him. And he looked at his armor and he said, Here, David, wear my armor. This is man's way to do battle. Put on my armor and go against this giant. And David, all he saw was a, a, a man, a Goliath, a, a giant that was too big to go after. But what David, what David saw, what David, when David took off Saul's earthly armor and with God on his side, what he saw was a target too big to miss. He was expecting God or he knew God would be helping him and what he saw was a target too big to miss. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? When we look at the glass in our lives and we think, how are we, ever, how, oh my, how are we going to get past this? How are we going to ever make it till tomorrow? And that giant is so big that, that Goliath or that sin or that, that whatever's standing in our way is too big to get around. But when we have God on our side, we see that we can make it. We can do it. We can't miss that giant. I don't care if my slingshot shot or whatever, I can't miss him. <clears throat> but David took off Saul's earthly armor that was cumbersome and slowed him down. He trusted in God to give him the victory over this giant and the Philistines. God had left Saul and he stood and Saul stood in fear of this giant that stood before him. Saul was alone. Saul did not have God on his side any longer and he was in fear. God sent David, a man after God's own heart with a sling and a stone and took down this giant. God sent Jesus and with two pieces of wood and three nails, he defeated Satan. <clears throat> As we see in the scripture, man's armor does not have any use for us. Our spiritual battles of life cannot be protected by anything man-made. It only comes through the presence of God and the victory that Jesus has given us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, thank you, Father, for the blessings of your word and, and this victory that we see that uh, David had, had won. And it wasn't through his own strength, but it was through your strength, Father. And we as humans, we look at the troubles that are in front of us or the roadblocks that are in front of us, Father, and we sometimes can't see any way out. We can't find the peace that we need that passes all understanding. But Father, when we seek your guidance and seek your direction and put on your armor, Father God, the armor of the Spirit, the armor you have provided for us, Father God, that, that we can have victory. We can have victory in life over the spiritual battles that we come up against each and every day. So, Father, we thank you for uh, this message. We thank you for these words that, we've, that we find in Scripture of this battle um, where David was the little guy that went up against the giant. And on your behalf and through you, he was the victor. Just like we are victorious in our faith and in our walk with Jesus. So we thank you, Father, for these words and these promises. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Thomas, do we have a uh, finishing prayer here?